So let's see. Oh, it's being recorded. I'm going to have to leave. I will right, we'll see you later. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, welcome, guys, to the um, to this week's mechanical team meeting. Uh, I forgot what number it is, but uh, I think. Uh, I don't know. I think six, right? Six? No fucking way. I don't remember. No? Is it six? Five? Five? Six? And it could, no, it could be five. It could be five. We've, yeah, we've had at least four for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought we had more for some reason. But all right. Well, anyways, um, we, we might only have a couple more meetings left. Uh, oh, man. Boo. I'll miss you guys. I mean, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to meet for sure in the winter, um, for sure. Uh, oh, since nice. since uh, there's no classes, we're going to focus more on the competition and testing and stuff like that. For sure. But yeah, so... We were gonna um, meet up or anything to build the robot. My bad. Um, right now, we're still. Richard said, "I think I, from what I remember, he said it was okay to meet." Um, but I want to meet uh, like in a more open space, not not oh, yeah. just this house. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, but I'll keep you guys updated on that um what else uh yeah so table of contents today so i'll be going over like updates and then we'll be going going over these uh topics uh that's related to the vehicle dynamics and then also i'll give you guys an example of how to calculate the force on the tire and then go over the tasks and also, I'm sorry if you guys hear noise in the background. Uh, I, I downloaded RTX Voice just to kind of minimize the noise in the background. So let me know if you guys uh, need nice. me to repeat anything. <laughs> All right, so updates. So today, we're going to pick uh, the final design. So if you guys aren't done by today, um, you guys can still keep working on it. but. Uh, if you guys want me to choose your design, the parameters list must be filled out by today. Um, yeah. So I talked to Dr. Shen last week, and he said that uh, drag force is negligible, so we can kind of not worry about that, just because um, usually drag force is something that you have to worry about if it's a a really large frontal surface area, or if we're going like around above 60 miles per hour. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah, so. We can fix that. What if, what if we make our car going 60 miles per hour? That's my thought, exactly. <laughs> then yeah, you can use jack toys. <laughs> but um, yeah, right now we could just, um, I guess not worry about it. And then, yeah, as Gio mentioned, like we're still, expected to build the chassis during thanksgiving break and um you know it's not mandatory uh to come uh just because of the virus and if you guys are busy with family stuff like that you know uh completely understand and also i don't know if they're gonna since uh corona cases are uh rising right now oh, i don't man. think it's a good idea to meet up but no, we'll I'm see already, what happens i'm already immune i'm chilling <laughs> I already yeah. I was the first um the, I was one of the first trials to take the vaccine so I'm good 90% cured are you dead ass no, wait what uh, <laughs> I was gonna I was say like, no I, like, I already had the virus I'm, I'm chilling back in July <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll see what happens see what happens I'll let you guys know for sure for sure yeah and then um since we're choosing the final design today we're kind of um Moving on from design to analysis and testing. Oh, anal ISIS. Yeah, so I think it's important to know that the design process takes a, a long time just because we want to make sure that we plan everything out and to make sure that everything's, everything's correct so that when, we, when it comes to analysis and testing, we don't have to worry about the design process anymore. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but can I like mention something? It's kind of a off topic, kind of not off topic. Um, no, no, no. 
sorry, in the aerospace industry, there's two types of design processes. One is where um, when you're going through a design process, you make sure everything is correct before you start building. That's one way. And another way is what like SpaceX does, where they kind of like build, test, repeat, build, test, repeat. They do like rapid designing. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I think I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just brought up some talk of it. Yeah, I mean, in our case, it's like, I don't think we can do that, you know? I think the only way we can. Money. Yeah, and also we can't. Uh, so, yeah, there's a. Okay, so I'll be moving on. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? Nope. Is that clear? All right, so I'll be moving on to uh, some topics. So my question for you guys is, uh, what is weight slash load transfer for a vehicle? Uh, when the vehicle accelerates, therefore the weight is transferred one, one part of the chassis to the other. Okay, That's exactly. Fine. Yeah. Okay. I, I already put in bullet points. So, oh, did you? I didn't. Yeah. Know. Um, so, so what, what is weight slash load transfer? So it's pretty much the, oh, it. the change of load on the wheel axles of a rigid vehicle during acceleration slash deceleration. So it's important to note that load transfer only applies when you're accelerating or decelerating. If you're at a constant velocity, then there is no load transfer, right? So that, that's one of it, uh, one part. Um, the other part is the change of the center of mass um, relative to the wheels uh, due to the suspension or cargo shifting. Um, yeah, so essentially when you move a vehicle, if you notice how like, um, the vehicle kind of jostles around um, due to the sus suspension or if you have like stuff in your trunk and um, stuff is moving around um, that's kind of that's considered a load transfer because your center of mass is changing um, if you guys remember last or i guess two weeks ago how the center of mass is kind of important when you're taking into consideration like the dynamics. Um, so when you have stuff like that, that's moving around, that also changes the distance. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I'm not gonna go over that second part. I just want you guys to know like, um, like what the two types of uh, load transfers um so yeah so basically that um that formula it it changes the traction on each axle so i put the traction formula below where your force of the tire is equal to the normal force on the tire times your friction coefficient and um if you look at the formula on the right it's uh, the load transfer is equal to ma divided by lh and I'll go over that in the, the next few slides. But um, essentially, it's a function of acceleration and your height of your center of gravity. Okay. Um, so my question to you guys is, why does it matter? Why are we focusing on this topic? Oh, ooh, can I say it? Um, yeah. If there's force, if there's force, that means um, less traction from one part of the tire to another that's a and b um that means the uh, motor has to do more or less work because you're changing the, the moment arm <laughs> i don't know exactly. where I yeah yeah you pretty much got it spot on that's um cool. yeah so it matters because of as you said traction stability and efficiency right so some of the things that um, I guess some of the characteristics of the uh, traction. So if you have a much higher load on the rear axle, then that could lead to understeering, right? So it's because since you have, you have such a large force on your rear axle, uh, you don't have as much force on the front tire. So 
you don't have uh you basically can't steer your tighter or your your vehicle and you know that leads to understeering so like if you look on the picture on the right so this car is essentially accelerating right and you can kind of see the front wheel uh lift off from the ground a little um so that's what happens if you have too much load on uh, the rear axle when you're steering. And um, same thing applies if you have the uh, much higher load on the front axle and that can lead to oversteering. So it kind of puts too much force on the front tire. So when you turn, it makes a really much sharper turn and that could lead to a spin out. Um, yeah, just kind of something to think about. Um, so the higher, the higher your center of gravity is, the more easier it is to have a wheelie <laughs> due to the oh, moment. Imagine yeah, so a wheelie in the competition. <laughs> yeah, so, so knowing that, so what is the optimal height? So for a rear drive um, vehicle, the optimal knows. height of your center of gravity is that you want some height to your center of gravity because it allows more traction on the rear tires, but you don't want too much um, to, to get like a wheelie if you accelerate, All right? So there's like a, like a sweet spot you want your, your height of your center of gravity to be. So in our case, since our robot is uh, front wheel drive, we want the uh, center of gravity to be as low as possible. So we want to reduce the load transfer pretty much. So we could get, so we can maximize the traction on the front uh, axle. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's three ways you can reduce load transfer between each axle. Um, so if you lower your center of gravity height, um, you get less load transfer on the longitudinal and lateral side of the vehicle. So what this means is that the longitudinal refers to um, acceleration and decel decelerating in a straight line, and lateral is where you're turning, right? So if you lower your center of gravity, um, you essentially kill two birds with one stone. Um, it makes it more stable longitudinally and laterally, right? And if you increase the length, uh, the, the distance of the tires, you get less load transfer on the longitudinal side. Right? So I guess uh, that's something that we can do if you wanna uh, reduce your load transfer and then also, if you decrease your track, I'm sorry, if you increase your track width, you get less load transfer laterally, right? So there's like different ways you can manipulate it. And um, you guys can like kind of test this out uh, with the formulas. So on the next slide, I, I wrote down the formulas. So I'm not gonna derive it for you guys. I'm pretty sure you guys uh, have an idea how, of how to do it. So in this case, um, drag force is negligible. So, you know, we don't have to worry about that. So NF refers to the front uh, axle and NR refers to the rear axle, right? So if you notice, we have two uh, equations here and GC and GB is the static load. So you're always gonna have this load no matter what. And the AH is the load transfer function. So that only comes into play when you're accelerating or decelerating, right? So this is why uh, back when I said, if your velocity is constant and you have no acceleration, you, you only have your static load on each axle. Um, so going from forward acceleration to braking slash deceleration, um, essentially, instead of subtracting 
the normal uh, the acceleration or load transfer you add it so it kind of switches right um, yeah does anyone have any questions so far kind of makes sense first all all right cool um so this is the weight on each axle for a flat surface right and something that pertains to our um, competition is that it specifies um, the gradient. So we have to focus on driving on a slope as well. Um, so it's the same function uh, as a previous slide, but we have to deal with the angle of the ramp. So, this is the equation. Um, as the slope gets steeper, you get more force on your rear tire. Right? So that's something to take into account. Um, the steeper it is, the more force you're going to get on your rear tire uh, because of this uh, uh, function right here. Because you're adding. Uh, you're basically taking away force from the front tire and adding it to the rear tire. And then you also still have your load transfer function. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty much why we want to minimize our load transfer so you can maximize the normal force on the front tire so you can get more traction. Um, Uh, that's pretty much it for the um, the load transfer. Um, I'll be going over an example so you guys can kind of understand why this is uh, important. Um, but I'll be moving on to um, DC motors. Um, so this is really important for the ME team because we have to kind of know how much torque there is, right? But before I want to go into that, I want to show you guys how to read a DC motor because uh, this is really important for us. So how do we pick a DC motor? Right. Since there's so many, um, we have to kind of learn how to read the spec sheet, right? So for a DC motor, the torque and speed are inversely proportional, which basically just means that um, as you go higher in your speed, you have less torque, and if you go, uh, if you if you have more torque, you have less speed. Right. So the no load speed and stall torque are, I would say, they're always given on a motor spec sheet. So these two values are really important for us, since it's a, a linear slope. We can find the. Um, we can use the equation of a slope to kind of find the torque on the robot at each current, uh, I guess, time step, right? Um, and if you look at the graph right here on the middle one, you can kind of change these values with the amount of voltage um, that's applied to the motor. All right, so if you, if you want less torque and less speed, you can put less uh, voltage, for example. But um, yeah, that's something that you can do. Um, and on the bottom graph here, so you notice how there's three, um, three areas. So we want to stay in the green area, which is the continuous range. And it's basically uh, your stall torque divided by three. That's like an estimate of where we want to be. And where we don't want to be is in the intermittent range or the red range. So if you stay in this red range for too long, like let's say, um, let's just say, for example, you have the vehicle and you turn it on and it's trying to move, but it's not moving at all, right? So you, you maximize your torque because there's no, uh, it's not turning at all. 
what's going to happen is uh, the DC motor is going to burn out. Like you're just going to kill it if it's more than like a second. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're designing a vehicle for any um, for any like robot or if you're working with DC motors, like you do not want to be in this area for more than a second. And then the intermittent range here, you can be here. Um, you can kind of like switch back and forth between the continuous range and the intermittent range. That's fine. Um, but I'd say uh, we can only be here for like, I don't know, 10 seconds, for example, rather than one second over here. <laughs> um, so knowing that this line is linear, you can actually find the torque of the motor by using the equation of a slope. So this is why um, these two values are so important. So you just need the stall torque and the no load speed um, to find your torque. All right, so your torque here is equal to your stall torque um, minus your ratio, which is a stall torque divided by your no load speed times your current uh, RPM of your motor. So this value is something that we can find here. And I'll show you guys after. So our in our case, this is our spec sheet for our motors. Right. So notice how there's um, four lines. I want you guys just to focus on this line here. This is the speed to torque ratio, this blue line here. Um, and essentially, this line is given by the no load um, speed, which is right here, and your stall torque, which is right here. Right? So putting uh, these values into the equation, um, you can find your, your torque. So uh, just as an example, if it's not moving at all, um your rpm is zero right so then your torque at that moment would be at your max which is your stall torque right and um something to mention is that you have to uh convert rpm into radians per second um this should be radians uh per second Uh, yeah. Do you guys uh, have any questions? Does it kind of make sense? Or are you guys stuck on something? Uh, so usually when you were picking, uh, when you're designing something, this is where um, you guys have to choose which DC motor uh, to choose from. Um, but yeah. Okay. So moving on to um, gearboxes. So what is a gearbox? I don't want Yovan to answer because I'm pretty sure you know. <laughs> what is a gearbox? Is it like a system of gears or something that's supposed to pull something up? I don't know. I remember we did something like that in the class. Yeah, yeah, it's really similar to that. It's What's the same like concept. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a gearbox. Um, so it's a set of gears, right? As uh, Geo said. Uh, so it's it's used to uh, increase torque or rotational speed um, due to mechanical advantage by using gears, right? So in our case. Usually, most of the time, it's used to decrease your speed and increase your torque, right? So essentially, uh, what we have here on the right is a 36 to 1 gearbox, which means that for every 36 rotations on the motor, um, the tire spins once, right? And 
something to keep in mind is that when you have more moving parts, there you get more losses due to friction. So it's not always like a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so when you're testing things, it's more like, it's always gonna be less than 36. So it might be like around 35.5 or something like that. Uh, I don't know the exact answer, but uh, there's always uh, more losses. So if you have a higher um, ratio, you can expect more losses due to friction. Um, so yeah, there's uh, you know, what's the usual loss. Like I'm pretty sure there's some sort of factor. Yeah, there's you can include that in the uh, calculations, but mm -hmm. in actual testing, um, there shouldn't be too much. You just have to get the you have to compare the rotation of the motor with the actual rotation of the tire okay. when it's running. So that's how you kind of get some real life uh data to test it with and then you're gonna see it's not always a one well i would say it's never a one-to-one -one ratio but it's close all right um okay so this is probably the most important part so how do we find the force of the tire all right so i'm gonna kind of uh guide you guys on how this uh model works so first, um, you have to look at the angular velocity of the tire. Right? You have to start at the tire first. So in this equation here, uh, the angular velocity of the tire is equal to your linear velocity divided by your radius of your tire. Um, I actually have... Uh, some numbers in the next slide. So uh, just to kind of give you guys an idea of how it works, but you have to find your angular velocity of the tire first, All right? So once you find that, you can find the angular velocity of the motor. So uh, you kind of have to go from your tire to your motor, right? And the way you would do that is you would take your angular velocity of the tire times your gear ratio. In our case, it's 36. So it's that. And then you have to look at the motor. You multiply by the gear ratio. And then that's how you find your angular velocity of your uh, motor, right? And then this is important because you can now plug it into that um, the equation of a line from the torque, uh, from the uh, spec sheet. So you can find the torque of the motor by um, by the uh, equation of a line times your uh, angular velocity of the motor, right? So once you find that, you can, you have to go back to your tire to find your torque of your tire, which is your torque of your motor times your gear ratio. So it's kind of like a back and forth kind of thing. So we have to find it at the tire and then you have to go to the motor. And then once you figure out the motor, you go back to the tire. Um, and then to find the force on the tire, you can um, find it with this equation. So your torque of the tire divided by your radius. Okay. And then once you find that, you can find the acceleration of your, of your model by, uh, this is kind of F is equal to MA rearranged. So if we have our force of the tire and we have our mass, we can find the acceleration. Okay. And this is just a simplified model. So there's actually kind of uh, more components, but this is kind of the general gist of it. All right. So if you guys are kind of stuck, I uh, actually put some numbers for you guys so you guys kind of uh, better understand it. Okay, so this example, um, if velocity 
is equal to zero. So we're starting from rest, right? Velocity is zero, and we have our radius of the tire. I kind of put this a random number, four meters. And the mass is equal to 100 kilograms, right? So if we're starting from rest, that means that our angular velocity of the tire is equal to zero. Uh, right. So if our angular velocity is zero, then that means our angular velocity of the motor is equal to zero as well. Because uh, zero times 36 is zero. And then you can find the torque of the motor by multiplying or just plug it in, plugging it into the um, the equation of a line. Um, so in this case, uh, this function here goes to zero. And so what we're left uh, with is the stall torque, right? 2.42 Newton meters. And then, so once we go from the motor back to the tire, uh, we can multiply it by the uh, gear ratio, which is 36. So you multiply your Tucker motor by 36, and then you'll get 87.12 uh, Newton meters. Right. Um, and then to find the force of the tire, you take uh, this number and you divide it by your radius of your tire, and then you'll get 21.78 Newtons. And then once you do that, you can find your acceleration by taking your force divided by your mass, and then you're left with this acceleration. Uh, and then something that I didn't include is that if you find your acceleration, you actually can find your velocity, right? So now it's moving because it's, it's, it's accelerating. And then you plug that velocity back into this equation and you repeat the whole process, right? And it keeps on repeating. Like once you find, um, like let's say once you find your velocity, you plug it back in and then you get another acceleration uh, number at a different time step. And then you get a different velocity and then it keeps on repeating back and forth, back and forth. Um, and that's how you essentially model the, um, the robot when it's moving. So if you want to test it out with different uh, specs, you can do that as well to see how it looks like, you know? Um, but yeah, this is like the simplified model of how to find like the force of the tire and the acceleration and velocity, right? Um, does anyone have any questions? So a little, does it make sense? Is anyone confused? Yeah, hey, wait a my bad, Tim. Um, did you, uh, okay, I understand this is supposed to like model like the acceleration of, a, of the robot, for example. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, did you include load transfer in this or no? Um, no, I did not. Did you include the acceleration? Acceleration and the acceleration? Will they both be um, equivalent? So that's yeah. The, that's, why I, that's why I asked about the load transfer thing, only because of the acceleration. Uh, yeah, so I actually didn't include that because it was a simplified model. Yeah, OK. Um, I just want you guys to get uh, familiar with the process. So um, I'm actually going to give you guys the MATLAB code that I've been working on, and it includes everything. Um, there's a couple steps that I didn't include, like um, your force of the tire is actually equal to your traction. So that's where um, acceleration comes in to play. Oh, OK. Because um, you know how it's uh, your normal force on the front tire? And that changes due to load transfer. Um, and the reason why I didn't put that there is because I think it was a bit, it might be, I might have been a bit too confusing for you guys to understand. But um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna send you guys the code so you guys can uh, mess around with it. Um, uh, yeah. Any other questions or otherwise I'm just gonna move on. Yeah. Okay. So task slash questions. So we're kind of at the end of the PowerPoint. So if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to let me know um, about anything. Just want to keep things uh, clear between us. I don't want any like confusion or anything. And I actually have a question for you guys. So do you guys feel satisfied with our progress so far? I say both yes and no. Mm -hmm. Yes, relatively speaking, in a sense where um where if we were to I mean at the pace that we're at and the time that we're planning on doing testing, to me that's adequate. But no, because at the same time it could have been a tad bit quicker. So at the end of the day, I'm totally fine with it. So for me, I am satisfied. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's just that uh, I guess the whole COVID situation, you know, it's uh, I know it's kind of hard on you guys and it's hard on me as well. Um, so, I mean, at the beginning, we would we would expect uh, uh, things to go out uh, perfectly. Like if we plan something, it'll be uh, kind of done on time. But, um, you know, I don't know. Things happen. I guess, and uh, I don't know. I just want to, I just want to get some feedback so uh, I can kind of like improve uh, in some areas that I think we should improve on. And yeah, uh, you guys can uh, direct the uh, chat through me if you guys don't want to. Uh, say questions to everyone but um other than that so this week i want you guys to uh look into fea simulations um on solidworks and perform any analysis on the final chassis um which is kind of uh i'm gonna pick the final chassis by today tonight and i'll let you guys know um, so the FE, FEA simulations are related to statics and kind of machine design, actually. And shape materials. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I, I want you guys to either, you know, work on a team or if you feel comfortable working by yourself, um, feel free to do that. But I want you guys to now look into um, FEA simulations. And I know Jose did two workshops on that. And it's it's on our YouTube channel, so feel free to look at that for any references. Uh, because once we find once we pick the final chassis, um, you guys are gonna do the FEA simulations on that. Um, and then for the MATLAB code, so after this meeting is done, we send you guys the MATLAB code, and from the parameters list um, that I have you guys fill out, you guys can actually put those values into the MATLAB and then see how the um, how the vehicle looks like when it's accelerating. Um, and then also compare it with each other to kind of just uh, see how uh, your parameters affected the vehicle dynamics. So, yeah, and then, you know, since we're picking the final chassis today, um, please send me your final chassis today, either by Discord or email, um, and use the pack and go function, um, because I think uh, we're almost, we should be done by the design process uh, today. And, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be free to help you guys out 
if you guys need any help today. But for sure, 100%, the final chassis is going to start fights today. Or we have to pick one at least. So we're going to pick one for now. And then if anything changes or if I see any uh, more efficient designs um, by next week, we can possibly do it. And um, yeah, so I'll go over every design by today, take the design, and then write like a short paragraph, um, pros and cons, and what I like and what things could be improved on for each design. And then, um, you know, maybe we can discuss it uh, like one on one or per team, something like that. Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it for uh, this meeting. And I can kind of, uh, show you guys the MATLAB code if you guys want. Um, do you guys want me to go over that? Um, I don't mind, sure. Okay. Okay, so I have two codes. So one is for a flat surface and one is for an incline. And um, so far for a flat surface, I'm pretty sure uh, these motors can drive all of our robots. I think it's over five miles per hour. Us. Yeah, we have to see what happens. But for the incline, this is where um, things actually really matter. So uh, it might be too small for you guys actually. Um, so I'm gonna be such guys this good. Um, and just, these are this is pretty much where you're gonna import all your your parameters. So and right here, this is gonna be the weight of your of your vehicle. Um, so this is in pounds, and it's already gonna be converted to kilograms. So everything's gonna be in SI, um, except at the end where I change it to miles per hour on the acceleration, just so it's easier to uh, kind of know if we're over or under the, the limit. Um, let's see. So this is going to be your mass, which is your weight. Um, if you guys remember the center of gravity length, so I have B, C, and your height of your center of gravity. So you're going to put that here. Uh, so this is converting from inches to meters. Um, I think that should be it. Just your mass and your uh, length, uh, your distances pretty much. And then once you guys have that, you guys can press run. And then you should get something like this. Um, and then once you guys get this, I want you to, um, screenshot it or, or save it and, um, put it onto the, uh, let's see, huh. I want to make a new sub team or you guys can put it under the chassis chat. I, I I just want to see how it looks like, and then um, I can I can uh, kind of describe uh, the characteristics one uh, with each team. Yeah, um, is that kind of clear with you guys? Yep. All right. Cool. Um, <clears throat> That should be it for this week's meeting. Um, you know, feel free to look over the topics again, because uh, we can manipulate pretty much 
all of these factors and uh, that kind of goes into the design process as well. So um, yeah, I think um, that should be it. Meeting is adjourned if there are no other questions. And I'll be here if you guys need any help or uh, want to talk about anything. For sure. Oh, that's good. All Thanks right. for coming. Later, guys. Take care. All right. See you, Jip.